Welcome to the 13th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee of 2018. Uh, we have received apologies from Alec Cole Hamilton and from Sandra White. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that your mobile phones are on silent and that uh, if you are using electronic devices for other purposes, please do not use them for recording or photography. The first item on our agenda is a declaration of interest and in welcoming Kate Forbes as our most recent recruit, I would also uh, wish to place on record my thanks to Jenny Gulruth for her service on this committee. So in accordance with section three of the Code of Conduct, I invite Kate Forbes to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Uh, thank you, convener, and I have no relevant interests. Thank you very much, and welcome formally to the committee and your first meeting today. The main item of business uh, for us today is the, uh, 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 the scrutiny of NHS Lothian. But before we reach that point, just one other item which has to be uh, dealt with, which is the subordinate legislation. We have one negative instrument uh, before us. The National Health Service, General Medical Services, Contracts and Primary Medical Services, Section 17C Agreements, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018. There has been no motion to annul. However, the Delegated Parish and Law Reform Committee has agreed to draw the attention of Parliament to the instrument on the grounds that it breaches the 28-day rule requiring uh, 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 instruments to be in place 28 days before they come into force. These regulations are intended to make various corrections to rectify errors in relation to two previous instruments which we considered in this committee, uh, and it is for this reason that it breaches the 28-day rule. Uh, the view of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee is therefore that the failure to comply with the rule is acceptable in this instance. Are there comments from members on this instrument? If there are not, are we agreed to make no recommendations on this instrument? Agreed. Thank you very much. That is agreed. Now, uh, we move on to hear from NHS Lothian. And can I welcome to the committee Brian Houston, Chairman of the Board, uh, Jim Crombie, the Deputy Chief Executive, Alex McMahon, the Nurse Director, uh, Jackie Campbell, Chief Officer for Acute Services, uh, Susan Goldsmith, Director of Finance, and David Small, Chief Officer of East Lothian, Integration Joint Board, and I understand, uh, uh, Mr. Houston, that you wish to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity. Um, can I just make one minor um, uh, correction? You introduced Jim Crombie as the Deputy Chief Executive. Jim is also currently Acting Chief Executive, and many of you will know Tim Davidson, who uh, unfortunately is on extended uh, medical uh, uh, leave at the moment. Um, uh, so just to, to make that clear. But uh, thank you again, uh, <clears throat> convener. Um, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to reiterate um, a, a lot of the, the long list of um, uh, descriptive uh, material that you have in the briefing pack. But I'd just like to, by way of scene setting, I suppose, just to touch briefly on um, a number of what we think the major challenges are. And these are probably self-evident to everybody by now. But nevertheless, they are the things that sort of override and influence the work of our board and indeed the day-to-day -day operations of, of the chief executive and his, and his team. And they are the obvious ones of, of the, the population growth trends that we face, the demographic changes within that, particularly the, the, the ageing of the population, the rising in demand for acute services that that, uh, that, that entails, and the, the increasing incidence of multiple health conditions, multi-morbidities, if you like, uh, impacting on the complexity of care that uh, we're required to provide. And all of that, of course, set against the need to achieve financial balance. Um, in the briefing pack, we have, also, uh, we have also listed examples of the progress that we have made um, in, in a number of areas, and I'm not going to reiterate at least all of these, but it contains certainly the actions that we are taking against the outcome from the last annual review. Um, uh, very particularly, and for the first time, of course, it uh, contains information about the recently introduced regional um, health and social care planning process and how, how we're engaging uh, with that. Um, it talks, I think, significantly, given a number of the, the challenges that we face around primary care, 
but it gives examples of what we are, what we are trying and testing and, and developing in terms of new models of primary care and primary care access. And it also contains, of course, examples of the, the hardware, the, the, the capital projects and, and where we are with commitments um, on these. Uh, the, the, other, the other comments that I'd like to make, just again by contextualising um, what I hope we're going to talk about today, is from a governance point of view, from the board's point of view, I think it's perhaps important just to give a bit of a flavour of where the non-exec, particularly uh, board members, see things in terms of NHS Lothian and its development and progress at the moment. I, I suppose I sort of summarise it by saying we're moving increasingly into an era of, uh, of, of risk management, that um, we are facing, as I've indicated in the challenges, we're facing what, what Tim Davison, were here, would call the great conundrum. And the great conundrum is, is about how we go about balancing um, you know, performance, uh, performance management in terms of, in terms of how, we, um, how we balance um, the, the protection, the sustainability of standards of patient care and quality um, and, and minimising um, things like um, access to, uh, sorry, optimising things like um, access to services, uh, balancing that with the need to achieve financial balance, um, also balancing it with the need to support a shift in the balance of care from acute uh, services into community settings and undertaking the resource and funding transfers, which that implies, from acute to community services. So the bal that is the conundrum, if you like, the balance between these two, if not three, factors, and also um, extending that further into our requirement and indeed our stated strategic objective to, as it were, move up the supply chain a bit, uh, to push ourselves back from treatment into the prevention and the inequalities um, agendas, which we all recognise are really the keys to sustainable long-term transformation of the way that we provide service. So because of that, that conundrum and these requirement to balance these issues, I think we as a board find ourselves increasingly wrestling with what does that mean in terms of, um, in terms of how we manage our risk profile? To what extent are we prepared to, um, to accept levels of performance in terms of capacity and access targets in order to protect a reasonable financial, financial balance? And I think to date, um, the, my, my board would agree that w the levels of assurance that we have sought against the way that the executive are going about making that balance and optimising uh, those competing, in some cases conflicting, factors is, 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 is good, it's adequate, it's satisfactory. We're happy that all the necessary stones are being turned over to optimise that balance. But on the other hand, we do wrestle, if not struggle with, um, the judgmental uh, requirement to take a view which says, for example, if our outpatient waiting list is going up from 5,000 to 20,000 over a, an extended period of time, then at what point, despite all the measures that we are taking to minimise risk within these waiting lists by prioritising by prioritising um, and patients and indeed other measures to do with, with access, at what point do we reach a, a level where simply as a quantum uh, that total figure of a waiting list becomes a level of risk in, inherent in that uh, quantum that we, we have to take different actions about. In other words, perhaps uh, putting at more risk um, our efforts to achieve financial balance. So I, I merely uh, sort of paint these brief, uh, as I say, that the, the Tim's word, the conundrum, um, because increasingly, from a governance point of view, those are the issues that we're wrestling with and trying to, to, to balance. Um, so I hope that's given you some kind of an oversight of, sort of where we see things and where we're at. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of responding to questions, I'm quite happy to, to field these, but to, but to um, uh, delegate these probably is the right word to my executive colleagues who will have more of the detail. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, very helpful uh, setting the scene. And uh, we will indeed have questions on 
uh, pretty much all the uh, matters to which you've referred. We had a witness on a different inquiry the other week who talked about the difficulty of uh, delivering uh, preventive and uh, health inequalities uh, agendas because the, the department making the saving might not be the department that then had additional budget to spend. Is that something that you recognise as part of the conundrum you've described? And if you do, what, what, what do you do about it? Well, I think it is. And I think one of the difficulties in terms of the accountability of a health board is perhaps that, you know, health economics, let's call it, comes into play at this point. And, and health economics, of course, has wider parameters than simply the, the accountability of the health board. Um, and therefore, uh, presenting, if, as it were, the business case, which we would do in areas that are directly within our remit, presenting the business case that says we need to invest further in the prevention and the wider um, inequalities ag agenda within that uh, is something, of course, that we can only uh, seek to influence and not directly control. I don't know. Susan, Jim? I think one of the things that we are recognising that is that we are going to have to take a risk. So increasingly we are, for example, in the region we are prioritising um, investment into in, in diabetes, the prevention of diabetes. That is going to be a major strategic priority for us. We don't necessarily have a funding source, but we have committed um, to, as, as three boards, is that we will put money into that. So, and it's the same, you know, in primary care, where again the board is taking a risk because we think we want to support shifting the balance of care, and so we may not necessarily be able up front to identify funding. So we take a increasingly take a risk. So just reflecting what the chairman said is that we're that's our focus is the, is the risk worth, you know, taking that investment, and we think it is. And what, what is that risk? What is the risk that you're conscious the risk of? Is, the risk is of not achieving financial balance. And the risk, obviously, is if we don't invest, then we will not, you know, we will not be able to sustain services going forward because the thing that is so significant is the upward trajectory in demand. Jim, did you want to add yeah, anything? So I would just build on what Susan said. The, the, one of the prime examples of a transfer of resource from acute to primary care is, is the shift of service out of acute hospitals to be prided in primary care. And there is a view that to do that, we create the services within primary care and we close beds in acute and the funding from acute transfers over and it pays. There's an issue of bridging that because often we can't establish a full service right away. So we have to develop the service and in the interim we have to maintain the bed base. And there's always that challenge. And should, should we be a board that decided not to move forward unless funding was directly available, there would be stasis and we wouldn't be able to move on that. But I think the ambition that's been characterised by Susan details that we are willing to say that looks like a robust model of care. We're going to invest in that and we'll use funding. We'll uh, identify funding that we'll use whilst maintaining the bed base with a view that once that's proven to deliver, we can transfer the resource across. Yeah, it's partly about the order in which you do things. Exactly so. Yeah. Uh, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, in recent weeks, we've heard about concerns with regards to the endowment fund in NHS Tayside. So I wanted to see if the panel um, could give us a reassurance that in terms of NHS low, the endowment funds have been spent in a way which would uh, be of the donor's expectation, specifically not on medical or surgical kit. Okay. Uh, as also with my a second hat as, as, as chairman of the of the trustees of, of the foundation, um, I, I think we can uh, give, give that assurance, but I'll, I'll pass to, to, to Susan, me just to elaborate why that's the case. Yep, within Lothian, we have a very separate system of governance around our endowment funds. We, we refer to the, the endowment fund as our foundation. So um, we have a separate charter, we have separate scheme of delegation, standing financial instructions, all our board members are inducted as trustees as well as board members. Um, and we have um, clear criteria against which any um, submission or application for funding comes forward against which the, the trustees uh, prioritise uh, funding. I have to say that the use of funds for medical equipment is entirely legitimate. Um, 
the, the, to the, the aims of the, the foundation and of the NHS are, are the same. Um, and our trustees, though, do recognise that we should not be using um, endowment funding for what we would see as core um, NHS business. But there are occasions, clearly, when um, we will decide to invest in medical equipment. And certainly some of the funds that are left to us are specifically for equipment. Um, so I'm very confident that we have got a robust system of governance around our endowment funds. Um, I wanted to move on to GP serv services, um, because one of the issues which... Um, over the last two years since I was elected as a MSP for Lothian has been um, what can only be described as a crisis within general practice. And, um, you know, I don't have time to list the number of uh, pressures within NHS Lothian and, and potential closures we're already seeing. Um, where do you think that can really be tackled and what sort of support do you think the Scottish Government should be providing you to, to enable that to happen, given what you've said already about the changing population, the growing population here in Lothian? Um, thank you. Um, I think there's an awful lot um, uh, happening currently, and, and in, in the in the in the let's say in the planning phase, or the early implementation phases, in terms of changes to the whole scheme of, of general practice, in, including uh, the, the the recruitment and, and sourcing uh, aspects of it. But I think I'll, I'll pass to probably to David initially to give us some yes. more detail on that. Um, I think I think the the agreement the Scottish government has reached with the BMA on the new contract is a landmark. Um, the, 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 the principle of the GP becoming an expert medical generalist and moving away from, over time, moving away from having to manage the whole team and, and the responsibility of premises, I think it is a landmark change. And I think it's, it's really important that the BMA and Scottish Government, health boards and the IGBs agreed in principle on the memorandum of understanding around that. It, set, it sets the scene for the next three years of change. Um, in terms of the detail, there's, there's a lot of detail in the contract, obviously, but there, there are several key points. Uh, the increase in funding for primary care is important, and there's two tranches to that. There's the increased income for practices this year, and there's increased funding to uh, health, health boards and health and social care partnerships to implement the various stages of the contract. There, there probably are two or three highlights to pick out. One is uh, how... how Health and social care partnerships will meet same-day demand in primary care. By that, I mean, you phone, you phone your practice, you'd feel you need to be seen that day. It's not always possible to get an appointment with a GP. Part of the contract is about setting up new systems to allow people to be seen the same day by a range of professionals, not always necessarily a GP, but a GP if necessary, uh, to allow GPs to focus more on that expert medical generalist role. The transfer of vaccinations from GP responsibility to health board responsibility is another key component. Uh, community treatment uh, arrangements for things like taking blood or removing stitches uh, and the transfer of premises responsibility from practices to health boards over time. It's a long-term programme, as people will be aware, no doubt. But the, these are key components of the transition, the transformation of primary care that we'll see over the next few years. And the, the lead role for health and social care partnerships in terms of developing improvement plans is also really important because that will be done locally with local GP practices and local stakeholders as part of the integration joint board's responsibilities. I, I guess we'd also be keen to just demonstrate some of the work that we've already done. This is, you, you characterise a, a situation of a service under duress and I, I would concur with that. Um, Often it's not about it's not just about new money, and I think it's part of our role as a board to ensure that that which we already have we use most efficiently, and in the engagement with uh, general practice general practitioners and primary care teams, we've established a number of initiatives to just test different models of care. So we've got examples where we are deploying Scottish Ambulance Service paramedics into practices to help um, triage and support the practice. We are identifying uh, mental health practitioners, psychiatric nurses that are being allocated to practices, again, to take a burden away. We, we are pretty advanced in our use of community pharmacy to support GP practices, and we're seeing positive feedback from the practices around the, the support and relief that offers. So there's a number of areas um, that we are engaged with already that I think will form a construct for using this new money um, and, and, and supporting primary care. My, my question really was pointing towards, you know, what has gone so you know, drastically wrong that we're not able to recruit people to Lothian? I've spoken to many medics who tell me that back in the day, 
people would be queuing up uh, to come and work in NHS Lothian in our GP surgeries and really where we're at now with the number of locums being used and, and actually um, an unsustainable service developing, how have we reached that stage and, and how do we come back from that apart from what you're saying is having to rely more and more on multidisciplinary teams? Well, I guess the future is going to be a multidisciplinary primary care team. That That's the future. What is... What has driven that? Well, a reduction in individuals wishing or choosing to work in general practice. Equally, there's a, a balance that's occurring now with uh, general practitioners who, the younger general practitioners, who are very clear that there's a work-life balance that they want to establish. And the concept of partnership is not one that is as attractive as it used to be. So the workforce ambition, the workforce culture is changing. And I think it's incumbent on us to recognise that and to support our practices to ensure that services to patients uh, whilst being provided by a multidisciplinary team offer the access that David spoke about, offer the outcomes and offer an assurance that people are being cared for properly. Can I just, can I just uh, pull Alex in here? You wanted to add? Just building on what Jim had given by way of initial response. So... Uh, I think it is a multidisciplinary approach. We often talk about general practice, and that refers to GPs when there are multiple others, pharmacists and paramedics and nurses. Particularly from a nursing perspective, we are now training a number at advanced practice, which means they can do a lot of the, diagnose, the assessment, the diagnosis, the treatment themselves. Um, we're going through a process just now of um, upskilling our general practice nurses, the ones who work in practices, so that they can do more around long-term conditions and indeed looking towards district nursing as well. So I think we can't be dependent on one professional group. We've got to look at them all. A brief supplementary from Alison Johnson. Yes, um, I'd just like to understand if you believe that difficulty filling posts um, and a lack of supply doctors fundamentally begins with a lack of training places. Because if you're saying that more people are attracted to a better work-life balance um, and that being a partner isn't as attractive as it once was. I mean, are the 898 places, I believe, that were available in 2017, are they sufficient or do we need to be ramping that number up? There's a number of issues around that. The attrition of trainees, I think, is a major issue that we need to look at. I think in, in training, we need to assure that the concept of primary care is attractive to people, and I think the training programmes need to perhaps reflect more opportunities to understand really what is available in primary care. I, I, I seriously, though, believe that we should not um, focus all of our attention on general practitioners. I think the future, sustainable future, is predicated on a multidisciplinary approach. So whilst we might see an increase in trainees as being the answer, that needs to be balanced against the availability of other practitioners who would offer as good, if not better, a service to the practice population. So I really do believe that this is a multidisciplinary future. Great, thank you very much. Uh, building on those questions, NHS Lothian should be in a relatively strong position to recruit and to retain staff. And I speak as a, a rural MSP in particular in terms of your location. But there are high vacancy rates amongst um, a number of medical specialities, particularly urology and dermatology. How do you explain those vacancy rates? I, I, I would concur with your comments. I think NHS Lothian is in a very good position in terms of its ability to attract clinicians. And you characterise a couple of examples where we are having difficulty. There are a small number of specialties where we are having uh, difficulty attracting uh, individuals. Um, so I think from a positive point of view, for the vast majority of specialties, we continue to maintain a positive recruitment model. But for certain areas, such as urology, perfect example, if you looked at the situation for urology UK-wide, you would see there are more posts available than there are uh, consultants ready. So graduating consultants, um, uh, doctors completing their, their, their training and being ready for consultant posts now have an opportunity to think of different posts. And whilst we might assume that um, NHS Lothian is an attractive proposition, people are choosing district general appointments, people are choosing um, to return to the areas where, where they've come from in terms of, the, in terms of their, their hometowns, etc. So it's a complex 
complex environment. So, and what are you doing to attract these posts to be more competitive than other places? So, so I think we have a an elegant and detailed understanding of what the demands are, and we'll continue to use uro urology if that's okay, the, the demands are for that service. And we're identifying technology and innovation that will support the workforce to continue to provide a service. We currently have a small number of clinicians, one, that has a clinical expertise in prostatectomy. And we identified that as a major demand stream. We projected forward and saw that as a major demand stream. So we looked at technology that was available to support that individual consultant and we were lucky enough to be uh, chosen to deploy the new urology robot. And that has provided an, an environment where for an individual consultant, that gives a bit of resilience and support. But in terms of attracting new consultants to that area, that's a perfect example of the type of thing we're doing. We do look with the other clinicians at job planning, again, because work-life balance continues to be a theme um, that we have to evidence opportunity in, in our recruitment process. So it's a combination of a number of things, I think. And are you currently, you mentioned uh, long-term planning there, are you currently looking ahead in terms of the future for potential pressures in other medical specialities? What might they be? So I think in our submission, we, we talked through our workforce planning um, that's become more comprehensive as we've engaged with our regional partners in, in Fife and Borders. So we've identified a number of specialties where we believe there will be, um, there will be pressures out there. That comes from twofold. The current workforce profile, so those clinicians who are at a point where they are within five years of retirement, so we're identifying that as in, in, in terms of a resilience issue. Looking at the demand profile at a subspecialty level around what's coming into the organisation and looking at the availability of trainees to understand will there be consultants. It's been more comprehensive around our agenda looking forward around things like the elective centres where we are trying to identify opportunities to deal better with the demand. Um, and Jackie might talk about the, our process in that later on. But where we've looked ahead, we see real pressures in some of the, the specialties now. Uh, we've talked about urology, radiology is an issue, anaesthetics is an issue. Uh, um, so, so very often it's a subspecialty that actually drives that real subspecialty um, um, specialism that drives the pressures in recruiting. So urology is a classical example and, and, and Jim's described that, that we, at the moment we've got a single-handed operator in relation to the robotic prostatectomy. We have, although we've not been able to recruit a substantive post there, we have been successful in getting a two-year locum to come in and join that team. So that will have a really positive impact there for urology. We've also just recently been able to recruit a consultant um, that will focus on some of our cancer pathways in relation to urology. Um, so we, it's very often that subspecialist area that where we find that as we're looking forward that we, that we may have recruitment difficulties. Part of our response, though, is similar to my response on primary care. We're identifying that the solution at uh, a specialty level is not just consultant-based. It's an opportunity, as Alex spoke of, to develop advanced nurse practitioners, to look at the role of EHPs, to look at primary care in a different way in terms of maintaining people. So it really is a whole system process to try and ensure our ability to deal with the pressures that we see coming. Thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Then. Thank you very and good morning to the panel. I think what I wanted to do is, is maybe explore in terms of workforce planning. It's not just about uh, recruitment, it's about uh, retention of staff and the, the, the increasing pressure in the environment in which they work in. Um, and looking perhaps at you know, what we're doing, are we cognizant of the health of our healthcare professionals? Uh, and that speaks to obviously a, a continuity of care and, and speaks to absenteeism as well. So I wondered what, what your thoughts are around the environment of which the, you know, our healthcare professionals are currently working and what you're doing to try and create that environment that, that allows retention and allow, allows recruitment. I, I guess the first thing is to really understand from the individual's point of view how they are feeling. So iMatters is a perfect tool that we use to just understand um, elements of, of workforce feedback. Some of that does raise issue around the pressure people are under. 
part of our process, and I go back to, it's incumbent on us not just to seek new investments and new funding. It's to ensure that we're using the funding we have appropriately. And some of that can see the development of additional admin and a clerical resource to reduce consultant time spent on admin, ro re uh, admin work, allowing them time to deal with the, the clinical work. Identifying other clinical staff, whether it be advanced nurse practitioners or others, again, to reduce the demand on, on individual people. Our occupational health service is, is, is a key support to us and where we identify individuals, we can offer them rapid access to occupational health. We are cognizant in our workforce plan of the age of our workforce. And similarly to the dimensions and the demographic changes we are seeing in the population, we're seeing that in our own workforce. So there is a recognition that we are seeing uh, an aging workforce. And some of the other issues we look at, the more acute specialties, is there an opportunity to take the more um, experience, more um, I'm trying to think of politically correct. The older uh, members of, of our team take them off things like on call to try and reduce the pressure and the strain on individuals. So there's a number of opportunities, I think, to be able to do that. I wonder if we could just widen that, maybe bring Alex yeah. in in terms of the nursing dimension. Yeah, I mean, just building on what Jim, what Jim has said, I mean, there are also interventions such as mindfulness uh, and yoga and exercise that actually I think people might dismiss, but actually the feedback we've had from staff during, say, their lunch break is actually having a 20 or 30 minute session such as that is a really positive experience for them uh, and gives them a bit of resilience. Resilience is the theme at, at the moment in terms of how do we make our workforce resilient for the current environment and for the future uh, environment. Uh, one of the things that we've done alongside the things that Jim has said is talk about what the career progression is that people can achieve um, from bands two when people just come into the profession at a relatively low level and the opportunities to move right through the bands through the education, training, development that we can offer them as well. So we're looking at them as individual uh, in that kind of career but also from a well-being perspective. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is around well-being itself actually so how do we provide um, staff with the opportunity to get nu nutritional food, not just the carbohydrate, the crisps, the snacks that they get sometimes? It's actually about that thing about fruit and veg, and I know that seems, sounds simplistic, but when you're working in a really pressurised environment, like an acute ward, actually making sure you get a good diet and actually fluids into you, you know, drinking plenty of fluids, is really important. So constantly reinforcing those messages is about well-being as well. Um, we do actively um, support flexible working hours to support um, individuals in, depending on their sort of personal circumstances, so we do that. The other thing that I think is really important, building on, on, on Alex's points there just now about wealth, be, well-being, we do have Healthy Working Lives Awards and, and a couple of our sites are sitting with gold awards there. That's where we actively encourage and support staff around exercise as well as the dietary elements that, that Alex discover, uh, discussed there just now. And one of the things that's really important, one of the things that we do is that we say thank you to our staff. So we look at Teams of the Month awards, we look at um, recognising what staff actually do on a day-to-day -day basis and actually take that opportunity to formally thank staff. And I think that all adds to the, the sort of the environment um, of supportiveness for our staff. If I, if I may, uh, convener, um, I think you'll find of all the people in here, I will not dismiss the, <laughs> the, the importance of nutrition and being physically active around I mean, the wellbeing and, and encouraging that into uh, encouraging that environment within our healthcare professionals. I think, but we know from a nursing perspective, from a midwifery perspective, that the, the, the health of our healthcare profession, professionals falls below that of the national average. And in a causal submission, they did state that you know our healthcare professionals prepared to almost sacrifice their own health to look after that that of others. So I would be interested that there is a high absenteeism rate within uh, the healthcare profession in many uh, in many um, disciplines. And I was wondering whether if this if this is being introduced within Lothian, do you have any um, uh, sort of number figures that would that would tell us that it's being effective? So I would probably say the answer to that around the nutritional bit. Uh, no, at this point, um, we have started a, a piece of work which falls on from the work that the Chief Nursing Officer uh, for Scotland has been leading on uh, around uh, physical and, and mental well-being. Um, there has been research evidence published from the University, Napier University here in, in Lothian that would tell you for a fact that um, nurses are more overweight than other healthcare professionals. Um, from that point of view, it's about how do we use that evidence to support those colleagues to get physically fitter and, and psychologically stronger. Um, some of that is about access to nutrition. Some of that is about access to uh, uh, you know, exercise, for example. 
Some of that's also about the working patterns that we want to look at, which is about working 12-hour days. Actually, they have a detrimental effect because you get up to go to work, say, around 6 o'clock, and you might not get home till about 11. Then you're getting back up again to come to work. Now, they do that for three days, but then they're off for four. Now, it, the evidence would say it takes you a couple of days to recover from those it kind of shift patterns. And again, one of the things that I want to do with other colleagues is to look at whether or not those shift patterns are the right shift patterns or whether or not we can move to something that's a bit more flexible, but also meets the needs of the wards, the, the teams, for example. Um, because actually, I think having less long days gives you a chance to go home, cook a meal properly, not just grab a snack, and actually spend time with your family. So from a family friendly point of view, I think that's something that we need to pick up and do more around. Thank you. Vinar, good morning, everybody. It's just a quick sup about um, uh, like other roles that nurses can do. Um, I'm a former theatre nurse who worked in California, and we had uh, uh, Jim Crombie, you mentioned uh, allied health professionals, and Jackie, you mentioned um, anaesthesia as a, maybe a, a vacancy issue. So in my previous role, we had nurse anaesthetists and physician's assistants. Are we looking at developing nurses' roles for nurse consultants in respiratory or urology or things like that? So I'll maybe contextualise this a wee bit and then I'll ask uh, Professor McMahon to come in. So, so the answer to that is, is yes, we are exploring a number of opportunities. An example that we might cite is around theatre nursing. Um, it's one of the areas from a nursing point of view, if we look across the spectrum of nursing vacancies, where we do have a problem recruiting. So we've identified the role of essentially scrub techs. These are individuals who can be trained up and become part of the scrub team and actually take the first place at the table with a patient and a consultant. We took the model from some ideas from the United States, but equally down south and in other areas, these posts have been developed. We've recruited from our own theatre teams. These are uh, care workers working within theatre. We, we started a pilot study where we trained, I think it was four initially, to, to, uh, to, to see if that would work. Obviously, there's a, you'll know as being a theatre nurse, there's a real important relationship between the scrub nurse, scrub tech and the consultant. And we were keen to just test if that would work. Overwhelmingly positive. Um, so we've rolled that out uh, across our whole area. There is a national issue on ODPs, and I think, Alec, you could update that. Firstly, if you're still on the register, I could give you a job. <laughs> so from that point of view, please do apply later on. Um, so so Jim, Jim, Jim's identified that at national level, um, there was a training programme that Glasgow Caledonian University used to run, and it no longer runs it for operating department practitioners. Uh, they very much support the running of the theatre. Um, we took the lead in loading to try and reconstitute that programme. Uh, it's currently out to tender. We've done that on a national basis rather than a regional basis. Um, so again, that's one. The other area is that we do we are a high user of agencies. One one of the small areas where we're still dependent on nursing uh, agency use for critical care and theatre. So again we're looking at a regional bank use so we can actually make sure that the nurses we've got work in our areas. So we try and grow them. So that sits alongside a training programme uh, as well. So theatres is definitely an area that where you know as Jim said, you know you know, scrub nurses, anaesthetic nurse practitioners, advanced roles, uh, theatre theater technicians, etc. So it's looking at everything from ads four right through to seven and beyond. Okay, thank you. Um, just to, Jim, Jim mentioned uh, advanced nurse practitioner training in primary care. It's not quite the same as nurse consultants, but we have a we have a vision for the future of a strong cohort of nurse practitioners working in primary care, partly as part of the implementation of the new, new GP contract to create that workforce. And we've already got some examples of them working in care homes in roles that GPs would previously have performed and uh, managing a same-day access service in Musselburgh. Nurse practitioners are the core of that service. Um, and we also use them in GP out of hours because of the difficulty we've had with recruitment of GPs, particularly to work out of hours shifts. And we, we've funded an advanced nurse practitioner training programme, which this year we're going to double the size of. It's a key component of moving forward, um, enhancing the role of the nurses and sustainability in primary care. OK, much. thank you. Uh, Brian, as the chair of the board, clearly it's your job to hold your colleagues to account for what 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 has been presented today as a series of works in progress. Uh, and and so what I'm keen to understand from you is how do you measure success? How do you insist that work that's in progress produces outcomes? And how do you measure that? And when do you measure it? Well, I suppose <clears throat> over the last four or five years, we've. Uh, put quite a lot of effort from a board perspective into the governance that sits around that around that question. And uh, for example, we have 
uh, completely altered our system of uh, uh, risk analysis and, and risk management and the seeking of assurance about performance against these risk factors. So um, we have uh, restructured um, the levels of risk appetite that we're prepared to accept or, 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 or aspire to in terms of all of the various factors in our in our risk register, and we then seek f from the boards from the board table to delegate the scrutiny of the detailed performance against each of these factors to our various governance committees, and now, of course, um, also through the the IJB and the partnership um, uh, links. Um, so we we think we've now got a fairly robust and secure system where. All of the factors in our in our risk register, which of course reflect uh, our strategic objectives, um, also have been um, analysed out and delegated down to the governance committees, who then scrutinise in detail the performance against these factors, and report that back to the board when there are issues, whether there are gaps, or where there are issues arising, or indeed decisions to be make to be made about significant new. Act, remedial actions to be taken to correct that balance. So I, 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 do, I do claim that we have moved quite a long way in the last four or five years in terms of the security of that structure of, of governance around performance and performance um, Im, Im, improvement. We have also appointed, um, within the last year, we've appointed uh, a head of governance uh, for uh, uh, Lothian NHS board, and, and that person's job is to put the, the, that model of governance that we now have around, around performance and around risk and to keep that under permanent scrutiny so that we're seeking to, to continuously improve and further the security of that, of that system. You talked earlier, or in fact, I think Susan Goldsmith talked earlier about the risk being particularly around financial balance. But what is the corporate approach, if you like, or the non-executive board approach to... Uh, the balance between that financial risk and the clinical risk, which has also been referred to in contributions. I, 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 I'll refer to, defer to, to, to Susan in a moment, but I think if you go back to my, my earlier remarks um, about that risk um, conundrum, um, if you like, um, it, it is exactly that. It is a conundrum. However, if you look at what the board has agreed, has defined as and agreed as its risk appetite, um, uh, priorities, then the priorities absolutely in terms of number one is is risks to patient care and quality of, quality of care and safety. Number two is about financial balance. And we try to stick with that order of priority when we're considering the work coming back from our, our governance committees and assessing performance and the actions that need to be taken. I have to be honest and say that it's very, it, very often we're wrestling with it, mm. uh, that we find ourselves, uh, you know, in a difficult place in terms of making decisions because some of those decisions, in particular on the financial side of that of that conundrum, um, are relatively scientific. You know, we can look at these and we can measure them and we can write down the numbers. When we come to look at the safety and care quality um, side of that of that equation, it can become more difficult. I mean, I instance the, the example of, of outpatients and simply the quantum of a, of a dramatically uh, increased total waiting list of people waiting outpatient appointments. There's an element of judgment. Once you, once you have taken all the steps that, that, that we think it is reasonable to take to mitigate risk within that, uh, within that waiting list um, rise, you're still left with a decision, a, judge a judgment, which says there comes a point where simply the quantum of that number becomes something that we simply have to accept is, is at an unacceptable level of risk. And that's a difficult, that's a difficult assessment and a difficult judgment to make, but it's, it's right at the top of our... It has the biggest share of our mind as a board, let's, let's put it that way, how to resolve that, that <coughs> question. I suppose one of the other things that we've, we are, we've outlined in our submission is we are trying to take a longer term approach 
to um, the financial position of, of the board. Um, Carolyn Gardner um, appeared in front of the um, Parliamentary Audit Committee and, and spoke about um, the requirement for boards to take a longer term approach to their financial strategy. And, and we are trying to do that because it's only by looking forward and trying to plan for the, the size of the pressure that we're going to face over the next three to five years that we're able to, to I suppose, shape and, and manage our response. So. Um, we've just started that, where we've we spent quite a bit of time ensuring that we've got good, robust financial management so that we're not compromising clinical care we're, um, because we're not getting, managing the money appropriately. We are now working on um, how do we support an improvement programme across the board, which may not save cash, but actually might support productivity, it might support mitigation of that upward pressure. Um, but we recognise as a board that the only way we're going to address that longer term financial strategy is actually working with other partners, which is with the regions, with the IGBs around the strategic planning. So, but, but the chairman's right, it's a, it's a continual challenge. And, and the only time where we've actually made an explicit decision was when... Um, I think it was going into 1617, where we did not have the physical capacity to, to meet all the um, our access targets, and we were, were contracting with the independent sector. And at that point, we made a decision that we no longer had the resource to uh, purchase activity from the independent sector. But the rest of the time, it is just a, a continual balancing act to ensure that we, we prioritise clinical services. OK, thanks. Uh, Alison Johnson. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that you've spoken this morning about the need to tackle inequalities, the need to, to get to grips with um, you know, upstream approaches and, and prevention. And I, am, I appreciate the honesty um, uh, that we're hearing about the fact that uh, the Board's taken an active decision to, to achieve financial balance. It might be you can't invest resource expressly in meeting targets. Um, has that inability to meet these targets led to the fact that Lothian has got the poorest A&E performance of all boards in 2018? Okay. Yep. So I, th I think it's it's useful to understand the quantum ar around that because I think it is a very important a, a very important uh, question. When we've looked across um, Scotland. What we are seeing is the east of region, the southeast of Scotland, is pretty unique in terms of its population growth. And actually, the projections forward demonstrate uh, growth in kids, in adults, and in the elderly. Um, and that's unique in terms of the rest of Scotland. It's about um, double that of the rest of Scotland, and it's about four times the population growth of the west of Scotland. So there is a real pressure building in our system. It's interesting to note that in the last 10 years, we've seen a demand increase for outpatients of about 45%, and we've seen an increase in A&E demand attendances of about 35%. So we are seeing a real pressure from population um, coming into, into our process. Some of that A&E pressure will be to do with the lack of GPs. Um, you know, a colleague um, has, has just lodged a motion yesterday about the, the GP crisis in West Lothian, and I think we'll be having a, a members' debate on that soon. So undoubtedly, all of these factors have an impact on we, people. We're now centre. tracking. Part of our ambition as a board is to really understand data and to understand the elements of demand, the elements of pressure at a micro level. So we are now tracking from individual practices um, the yield to attendance at hospital, uh, in the emergency room and the yield to admission from that attendance. So we're starting to create a portfolio that we're working with the IGBs and the IGB chiefs to really try and understand the dynamic. Is this because when they called primary care to get a GP appointment, you were unable to offer access and therefore that converted immediately into an a &E? Is it an issue of ease of access? I don't need to call the GP, I can just show up at the hospital and I'll be treated. Is it because we're not identifying early enough in a clinical pathway that a condition, a chronic condition is changing and that's resulting in an emergency admission? So there's a number of flow issues. Using the data, I think it will allow us to explore these in a lot more detail than we have before. Okay. I mean, moving away from A&E, one ongoing um, area of great concern. I'm, you know, even yesterday contacted by constituents who are very concerned about the, the paediatric situation at St John's. 
Um, how is that being dealt with? What I'd like to understand is, if you had all the cash and resources in the world, would you be able to solve that, or is there another problem at the core of that? So I'm, I'm going to ask my colleague to come in, uh, Jackie, to talk in detail. I, I, I guess it's not an issue of cash, and I, and I need to be clear on that. It's not a funding issue. The board, in its review of the St John's uh, inpatient service, committed itself to maintaining the service there and committed, as Susan characterised, at risk an additional £2 million to make sure we could attempt to recruit additional members of staff to support that service. But I'll ask Jackie to in detail talk through where we are. That's lovely, thank you. As Jim has described, we have an ongoing commitment to um, ha uh, maintaining and, and delivering a 24-7 service at St John's, so that hasn't changed at all. In terms of recruitment, despite what is a national backdrop of um, shortages of paediatricians, we've actually successfully recruited seven additional consultant paediatricians into NHS Lothian. Currently, I'm actually working in the department, we have five workers working one of the, the, the most recent appointments we just appointed um, earlier this year and doesn't start with us until August. And one of our most um, recent appointments is actually on maternity leave. But we do have five additional consultants into the service. Over and above that, we've actually been um, training to advance paediatric nurse practitioners, and um, they should be ready to start to participate in and out of our rota towards the end of this year. We're about to um, recruit again and advertise again, sorry, um, next month in relation to further um, advanced um, paediatric nurse practitioners, both to see if there's any trained practitioners out there, but also to recruit trainee practitioners. And we have a further course starting in September. So, this, as Jim said, this is not about money this has been an active and proactive and continuing recruitment drive but despite all of that we require 39 out of our shifts to be covered every month and at the moment based on our substantive staff we're, we could provide about 21 so we still have a way to go around having a sustainable aim um, out of our rota okay now you're saying that specific issue isn't about cash um but with regard to all of the, the other issues facing NHS Lothian, do you feel you have the financial resources to meet the targets that are being asked of you? Or is it simply impossible with the package you currently have? So, so I guess I would say there's a, there's a requirement for the board to demonstrate an effective use of its £1.5 billion pounds that it gets. But we have characterised a gap in our ability and our capacity to deliver against the access targets. We've been clear to the board, we've been clear um, to government that there is a significant element of funding that would be required to allow us to, to recover. Part of the request from Scottish government was to present an op what they characterise as an operational plan, used to be called an LDP. It's now an operational plan for, 90, eh, for 18, 19. And in that, we've characterised all of our intelligence around demand, um, all of our intelligence around efficiency, productivity, and maximising the use of our resource. And, but, but even doing all that, we've characterised a gap and we've characterised the quantum of funding that would be required to allow NHS Lothian to return to the levels of performance in terms of patients waiting over 12 weeks um, at March 2017. I think one of the other elements of that is even if we had the funding to return to in um, March 2017, we don't have um, the overarching capacity either internally or with um, the external providers in, in relation to that. And there's an, often a lead-in time um, in starting up capacity, which is why Susan described it. We're really keen to be looking at at least a three-year programme so that we have an opportunity where we can look at additional resource whilst we redesign our services behind that. What is the gap? Well, we've we presented a number of options, um, a series of options that see incremental improvement, they see delivery of key clinical priority services, and they see the return of NHS Lothian to 17. You've, you've characterised not only the existence of a gap, you've also described the quantum of the gap. So what is the quantum of the gap? So to return uh, NHS Lothian to the position of March 2017, is thirty one million pounds, circa thirty one. So, so so essentially that's your your assessment on the basis of the services you're responsible to deliver of the shortfall in funding. Okay, thank you very much. David Stewart. 
Uh, thank you very much, Convener. We've touched, I think, already today on the issue about um, how you assess risk, um, and uh, Mr. Chin, you've covered that quite substantially. What I'm interested in is how you assess risk and how that feeds into developing your strategy and how flexible you are to do that. And on your submission, the very last page had a very interesting triangle when you said, basically, in order to look at transformational change, um, we, it's beyond our own capability. We need to look at regional and national strategy. Is that a correct analysis of your triangle? Analysis. I would also extend it further. I think if you look at... If you look at the submission that's been made by the regional team under Tim Davison's leadership, um, it, it states very clearly, I think, also that uh, the best efforts of the regional planning team to seek additional uh, efficiency-driven uh, benefits, let's say, going forward, has come to much the same conclusion. I mean, it, it has basically said that as far as we can see at the moment, we can see a way clear to adding some additional benefit and taking the bottom of the pyramid that's in that you're referring to, the pyramid um, uh, diagram that's in Susan's financial um, plan. Um, it, it takes us to the, only still to the bottom two rungs of that. And therefore, from the, the regional um, planning function, in Tim's view, now becomes one which says, OK, we will do everything we can to go out and maximise that bottom, these two bottom chunks of the pyramid. But we are saying now very clearly that in order to move us up to a six to seven percent and cumulative annual um, 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 savings target, we are going to have to come up with some different prisms through which to look at the business model. And, and we haven't, and we don't have those answers. We're saying at the moment this is a this is a grey area that we, we sort of understand the questions, but we need now to put a lot more effort. And this, of course, is a regional, if not a national, um, issue. The other, the other regions are coming up with very similar, very simpler views about it. So there is a task to be taken on, which is about the transformational level of change, if you like, which sits at the top two sections of the pyramid that Susan and her team have constructed. Mm. And uh, clearly you've, you've what, the second largest board in terms of population, you've got some characteristic other boards don't have. If I could just flag up some of these, in your high risk, uh, or in your medium risk, I should say, you talked to pres prescribing being a problem. Now, obviously, all the boards in Scotland will come before this committee, and that's, that is a problem in other boards as well. But if I take issues like hepatitis C, where you've got some considerable issues, has that been one of the factors why your prescribing has been a problem in, in terms of being beyond budget or something? Right. Okay, yes. Susan? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's across, again, it's not just Lothian, it, across Scotland, the proportion of, of our spend on drugs, whether in, through GP prescribing or in, the, in our hospital sector, has become an increasing proportion of, of our budget. Um, so, as a result, we have invested a significant amount of resource with Scottish Government funding and our own funding into uh, providing pharmacy support. Um, and that has generated significant savings, but those savings just have to be ploughed back into supporting that, th that upward trajectory that I keep referring to. So, so we do see benefit from investing in pharmacy support, but we require it to continue to fund the, the, the increasing drug spend. It's either coming from the demographic um, or indeed in GP prescribing. One of the things we're seeing now is short supply, and that affects price. So... Something like Hep C, we've we've done well in t nationally securing um, reductions in the price, and um, because we've worked together across Scotland. But in, but in GP prescribing, we're seeing the impact of you know the, the global economy on some of the drugs that we procure. So it is a continual pressure for us. And how flexible is the board when it comes to the strategy? So, for example, if you see changes in the characteristic of, of your board area, how quickly can you change the strategy that you're looking at if, without being frivolous? If I can throw in the military analogy, I think it was a German military strategist talked about any strategy collapses with the first contact with the enemy. Now, I'm not suggesting that's the, the way you would look at it, um, but clearly it's relatively easy to develop a strategy in an ivory tower. Whether it works in practice is another issue. I think it's... Um I think it's not too much your, your German friend's um, uh, analogy. It's, um, it's more to do with the, this, the scale and complexity of the deployment that's required from the point of agreeing a change to strategy 
to actually getting that uh, getting that into place. And and we're striving to get better at that process all the time. But we are still a very large and complex organisation. Um, it's not an instant process, Jim. We we developed a strategy in 2014. We published our strategy in 2014, and and Alec can talk through the detail of that. But that really was an attempt to characterise what our vision of the future was, and that took account of demand. It took account of demographic changes. It took account of disease profiling. Uh, Alex, maybe you want to. So our, our health and care of future was the name of the strategy. It's 2014 to 2024, and um, so it it describes a lot of the discussion that we're currently having. But it also articulated um, the kind of stakes in the ground, as we called it. So the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, the Western General, as sites that we would not be discussing coming off, but how we would develop or, or redefine some of those uh, sites. Um, that allowed us then to go back and look at what other services we had on other sites that didn't necessarily have to be on those sites that we could repatriate onto others or make them actually ma maximise their opportunity. So that's allowed us to progress with a number of... I'll, I'll use the word closures, but if you want to talk about shifting the balance of care, shifting the balance of care, so for example, Kerstor, in hospital, uh, Murray Park, uh, the reduction in the Liberton site in terms of the bed base there as well, the development of his loading community hospital, the work around the Royal Edinburgh reprovision. These were all characterised in, in our strategy, so we've actually been progressing those and enacting those over the last couple of years. Okay. And to find out if I have time, um, I touched on earlier how you need other groups to help. So tell me a little bit more about the help and support you receive from Scottish Government. Um, you, when you're developing the strategy, what discussions do you have with them? And is there any wider issues for the committee about issues such as how capital planning and revenue planning is allocated? Is there any issues that we should understand from you on that issue? Alex, I'll pick up the general strategy point. So um, <clears throat> it's probably fair to say that when we were developing the strategy, your Scottish government colleagues were very close to us. Um, and I say that in a positive sense. Um, from the point of view of actually the ambitions that, that we have and the government has around shifting the balance of care, about providing care closer to home in the community. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the financial aspects of that. We don't have bridging monies anymore, so actually it is about how do we actually secure that transition whilst making sure that patients are kept safe or that, they, that we build up the community capacity whilst running down the inpatient capacity, for example. So I would probably say from a planning perspective, they've, they've been very helpful with us. I guess in terms of revenue, though, Susan, I'm not sure if you want to talk about NRAC. Oh, well, NRAC, as we, we talked um, earlier about some of the, the pressure that we feel in Lothian around the demographics, and one of the challenges for us as a board is that because of the way the formula works, which influences our bulk of, of our um, allocation, it's based on population, and of course, it's relative population. So as the East population grows and the West declines relative to the east, um, we are perpetually trying to catch up in our share of the, the total pot of money. So almost year on year, we are behind our, our target allocation, and, and that clearly gives us a challenge. But we're, we're, we're in dialogue with the Scottish Government. Uh, it's recognised that that is an issue for us, and we'll continue to be in dialogue with them um, year on year. And just on a uh, final, final question uh, uh, related to finance on, on Brexit, you've probably followed our discussions on, on Brexit in earlier committees. But one issue I raised with the cabinet sector I'm quite concerned about is the effect on reciprocal health care. So, for example, the S1 and S2 schemes that Brits abroad get. Um, if that, there might be a transitional support there, but for new, uh, new Brits going abroad, there's real issues that they won't get uh, health care and may return to Lothian and other health board areas. I know there's Scottish figures on this. If you looked at this in Lothian, if the effect on additional social care and primary care demands from people who are currently living in the 27. We're only just yes. in the middle doing, of that, uh, doing that piece of work on a, an assessment of what Brexit might be. So I can't answer your uh, question explicitly, but that is a piece of work that's underway currently. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Risk Absolutely. If I was you, I would do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. In, in relation to the shortfall in NRAC that you described, uh, how does that relate to the £31 million gap to previous performance levels? That well, the £31 million re relates to in our, uh, access targets and, and so it, to, to achieve um, access targets, we would need to spend an extra £31 million, um, although that would only take us to our March 17 performance, yeah. that the NRAC is, is on top of that. That is just, it's just that it's to support to a, all demographic. So growth. to achieve your full NRAC allocation, what additional funding would you have had to receive For 18-19, we're short about, we will be short by the 
the time we get to the end, 18, 19, about 14 million. 14 million. Okay, thank you very much. Ivan McKee. Thanks, Convener, and thanks for coming in this morning. Um, I read with interest through your submission, um, specifically with regards to some of the areas of um, performance shortfall. I'll maybe come on to them in a minute. But there was just a, a, a few things I'll just kind of work, work through, picking on some of the points you've made earlier. It's a very interesting introduction, and I understand the challenges. Um, and you spoke about the conundrum, um, and you talked specifically, you've mentioned it a couple of times, about on waiting lists and the overall waiting list target, and then the way you manage within that to make sure that individuals aren't exposed, for want of a better word, in terms of the, where they are in that process. Do you think that kind of suggests that we're, at a top level, we're kind of maybe measuring the wrong things if we're focused on an overall target, but within that, there's maybe other things that are more important? Um, perhaps yes, but I think I'll, yeah. I think I'll bring Jim sure. in at that point. <clears throat> that's that's always a question, isn't it? Are are, are we? I think as um, Harry Burns or Harry Burns characterised in his report, are we hitting the target and missing the point? And I think there's an element to that. And if you spoke to clinicians, they would characterise examples of that. However, there is absolutely, certainly from from my opinion, there is a there is a benefit to us delivering earlier access. Uh, to treatment and to assessment. I think that's an important principle. We have, however, recognised that we are in a different place than perhaps we were before. And with so many people waiting, uh, either for outpatient appointments or for inpatient treatment, we need to change our approach to managing this. Uh, Jackie, I think, could talk through our approach um, and that might offer a, a bit of insight into it. Okay. So, as Jim described, it is an area that we've recognised that is, is a risk for us as an organisation with our long waits on our outpatient waiting list. So, we have worked with our medical director and we have developed a clinical risk matrix that looks at services um, and the volume of patients on those waiting lists for those services in, in, sort of in terms of the probability that um, serious um, diagnosis um, could be delayed in being diagnosed or um, that their condi a patient's condition could deteriorate. So, on the of that risk matrix, what's we, what we've introduced is a keeping in touch process where we actively contact patients that are on our waiting list and we do that for a twofold reason. One, give the patient reassurance that they are still on that waiting list, gives us an opportunity to um, assess if there's any change in the patient's condition. It gives us the opportunity if that has been, um, if there is, is a change for us to escalate that back to the clinical team and to um, potentially bring for, um, an appointment forward depending on what's said there just now. We've also found through that process there is a number of patients whose actually condition has got better um, and, and they actually advise us at that time they're no longer required to be on the waiting list and that has a benefit for other patients on there. So, so, so we are looking at a clinical risk uh, basis. Another good example is probably within our endoscopy service which is one of our higher risk services where we've worked with the clinical team to understand fully from, from the consultant perspective where our highest risk patients are. So although we do look at and report on urgent suspicion of cancers and urgents. Actually, within that service, some of our highest risk, risk patients actually sit in our repeat or surveillance queues, not in the new queue. Um, and we actively um, have converted some of our um, capacity for those high risk patients. So we continually work with the clinical teams and calibrate our, our capacity to our highest risk patients. So I suppose the question, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there. If you got a suite of measures that you use internally to kind of understand the profile of what you just described. Yeah. yeah, so you kind of can track that. That's good. Okay, I'm kind of moving on. Talked about a preventative spend, and it was really interesting. You talked about taking a risk, um, which I fully understand. You mentioned diabetes in primary care. I suppose the question is, how well do you understand that risk? So if you're putting in X million here and expecting Y million back, Y being greater than X at some point in the future, um, how do you understand? How well do you understand the time phasing of, of when that happens and and what that ratio is between the input right. and the output? Yeah. And have you got from time. sorry from from yeah. your experience or are you leveraging learning from other health boards or other parts of the world that have yeah. gone this journey? Okay. Alex, well, you want to put you in? Sorry, Susan. <laughs> Alex, Susan. Oh, go on. So I, I think one of the things that we um, are developing um, is and, and Jim referred to it earlier is our use of data and metrics so I think the answer to your question is currently we probably don't understand it well enough so what we do know is that um, we spend probably about you know 10 percent of our total allocation um, provides health care to individuals who have diabetes so they might have other conditions but they've got diabetes so so um, 
that's very much worth taking a risk. We, we, we spend some money and, and we won't get the return for a long time. But, but that's almost like a no-brainer, isn't it? But for other areas, um, and, and we will develop on diabetes measures, and, and that using the data that we are increasingly using, we'll use measures, develop measures for that kind of an investment. Primary care, we will we know what the demographics looks like and, and what type of activity we need to see provided in primary care and community services. So increasingly we will measure that. But I think that's very much developing at the moment. Okay. And just on the diabetes point that Susan's made, so we in Lothian have circa 35,000 diabetic patients. Um, most of those are, are type 2 diabetes, which can be prevented or reversed. Um, that costs us about £110 million a year to treat. Actually, there's a whole swathe of evidence that says if you get people into um, dietary programmes, weight loss programmes, um, actually, and sustain it, we can reverse that number. And actually, that saving could be reinvested. So that, that's absolutely a punt that we need to take in terms of investment and money. So we will do that through monies that we also get from the Scottish Government around the, the obesity weight management strategy that will come out to make sure that that's the kind of thing that we need to, to look to invest in going forward. Because the return on that from an individual level is huge, actually. And, but, uh, for, but from a society and an organisational point of view, significant as well. And one of the, just to touch on that, one of the things that we've kind of mentioned and we've looked at as well is around about Hep C. Well, some work going on in Spiffield and Dundee, I think, uh, if, if you invest significantly now, you can reduce the incidence to such a level that the reinfection rates kind of drop right off and you can save in the long run quite a lot. Is that something you're focused on as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we do try to channel our investments in a way that will support a reduction in the, 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 the level of cost of care that we, we provide. Quite interested in another area that was in your submission around about demand management, um, and you referenced that in terms of A and E, and you've actually got a graph there that shows quite a significant improvement there, um, and you talked about early triage, flow centre, clinical algorithms, and stuff like that. Um, do we just want to talk a wee bit about what you're doing in demand management across the piece because that does sound like something. That's yeah, that's, I guess we were showing a reduction in demand until the beast from the east arrived, and that blew our. Um, uh, trajectories out the water. It, I guess it brings me back to the point I was making. We are challenged as a board, and, and we should be challenged as a board, to demonstrate effective use of the resources we're allocated. And one of the areas we need to look at is not just expanding capacity to meet increasing demand, but actually look at the causation of demand and try and reduce that. And you've seen from the data you've had a look at um, some of the uh, outcomes associated with the work we've done. I guess, Jackie, David, I'd be keen to get your, your view on actual examples yep. where we're demonstrating an impact. Okay. So, so you've already um, sort of discussed the, the flow centre there just now. The flow centre is a real success for us in NHS Lothian and is actually an area that we're now looking at on a regional basis as well. The flow centre works in collaboration with the Scottish Ambulance Service, with our primary care colleagues and with the acute sector and looks at how do we best um, um, divert patients to the best pa place for their care and that may well be to an ambulatory care um, area such as a, a rapid access clinic rather than having to present to ED. So we have um, put in place some, a frailty hub at uh, West Lothian, or, or sorry, based within St John's, but it's part of the West Lothian um, working there just now. We've put in rapid access respiratory clinics so that patients, rather than having to present to ED, can have access to that clinical team there just now. So it works very, very well around diverting patients um, to the right place for their care. Um, David will talk a bit about some of the work that's happening in primary care, but before I hand over, some of the other areas are, are a real success story around demand reduction. Again, I think it's within our submission pack there. As if we look at gastroenterology, again, one of our really um, pressurised outpatient services there. Through, through working in um, collaboration with our laboratory colleagues, with the clinical team in gastroenterology and with our um, general practice colleagues, we went through a testing and then a full implementation of a new test that can be carried out in, in, uh, in the GP practice that has actually reduced the number of referrals into secondary care by 400 a month and we have, have seen that as a sustained reduction. So that's a, a really good example of working collaboratively and reducing our demand. 
I can add some examples from primary care. There's two levels to this. One is the work we're doing across the whole of Lothian, and then there's individual work in each of the partnerships. Now, across Lothian, we have a referrals advisor service. It's a, a GP who works between secondary care and primary care, and they work on um, referral protocols for elective outpatient referrals, the kind of thing we've been talking about, to ensure that the, the most appropriate patients see the right kind of specialist. And then they turn that into an electronic referral process, so the GP can make the right referral while sitting in the clinic, but it's the right referral to the right specialist, but also go through with the patient all the other things that need to be done before a referral is appropriate, because there often are steps that can be missed and things can be dealt with in primary care. We also have a secondary care, primary care interface group and a laboratories interface group where primary care and secondary care sit together and discuss exactly these kind of issues, demand for tests, taking of blood, etc., etc., to ensure we get the balance of demand in the right place for the right kind of patients. At a more local level, in Mid Lothian, they're testing an enhanced triage system in, in two practices. In East Lothian, uh, we've been uh, piloting what we call the, the, the Musselburgh Access Service for 30,000 patients, so same day access. And there is some early evidence that the AE referrals from the Musselburgh practices have dropped off. As hopefully as a result of that, early days, but we would hope to be able to demonstrate that. In Edinburgh, they've been putting physiotherapists into practices to deal with musculoskeletal problems that can often end up in A&E and with orthopaedics. And in West Lothian, they've been, they've been the lead area in, in Lothian testing SAS, ambulance service paramedics doing home visits, so that home visits can be done quickly on time by the right kind of person, and again to try to avoid A&E referrals. No, that, that, that's, that's all good. My final kind of area I wanted to touch on was around about what I would call kind of process improvement process, and you've kind of touched on that already, and you talked about the data tracking stuff. I mean, to my mind, of what you do there is you, you figure out the reasons, that the drivers that are causing things, then you pre to that and look for the biggest hitters, then you go figure out the action plan, and then you go around the look and see if it's working, and then you should see the needle coming down on your top line. Right, we've got all that stuff. Right, so... <laughs> Um, so how how recent is that process? How robust is it? Is it still being rolled out? And then the second part of that is, at a very top level, how much of an improvement do you think that can deliver as you kind of start to drive those improvements? So, so yeah, in terms of the first question, constantly and continually, and we look at reports um, weekly. Our ambition is to actually look at some of the demand issues on a daily basis once our uh, information system evolves to where we want it to be. But certainly weekly, absolutely monthly, and then we trend, look at what's happening. Um, so we can identify if, if a new service, such as David or Jackie described, comes in to be, we can track what is the outcome from that. Um, David says we're already seeing early indicators of, of the, the difference, the, the approach that's been taken in East Lothian around attendance at hospital. So that's something we're tracking and we'll wait, we'll wait and see where that goes. So it's a consistent and continual process that allows us, as you describe, if we think, well, that's not delivering what we thought it would deliver. Why is that? And we can look at that quite quickly. I've forgotten what your second question Yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of been optimistic about this stuff. Um, continuing to do that, what impact do you see that on the, the, the top level in terms of performance, but also in terms of financials? Because, I mean, that you should see a 1% or 2% per oh, yeah. year improvement there, if you're doing Susan, it right. do you want to come well, in The, on, the on thing that? I was going to add is, that I think as well in our submission, we've referred to the, the development of our quality strategy, and, and we have developed a quality Academy, which is, is actually giving our staff those kind of skills so that, you know, wherever they identify an opportunity of improvement, um, they have the skills, but also we will provide additional data analysts, improvement advisors, project managers where required. And that, that links into the, the triangle and the improvement aspect of our longer term financial strategy. But we're still at the early stages of that, but the board is absolutely committed to uh, the rollout of, of the Quality Academy across the organisation. Good. OK, that's great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to the panel. I wanted to ask uh, the board particularly about the issue of delayed discharges and how that relates to the IJBs, because we know that delayed discharge obviously is an indicator of um, you know, the success of the entire system, not just um, the discharge itself. So in your submission, you said that there are specific and acute issues relating to performance within the Edinburgh IJB. So I suppose my question would be, what is the board doing to support the efforts of the IJB in this area, particularly with long-standing delayed discharge? And in your answer, if you could, it would be quite helpful, um, I think, for the committee that obviously we know this is a serious issue. Um, 
we also know that we're probably not quite seeing the progress that we'd, we'd like to see here. And so could you explain areas um, where you've been doing things that maybe haven't worked so well and then what you are going to be doing differently in the short term to address this? We, we agree with the question and the way you framed it. Um, uh, this is a huge issue and it's been a recurring issue and we are extremely frustrated about it, I suppose is the first thing to say. But having said that, Robert David? Well, I'll come in first. Okay, first. go on. Yeah. So, so you characterise delayed, dis delayed discharges as, as a major issue for the board and I would absolutely concur with that. There have been a number of... I, I guess the first thing to say is we're not about characterising the IJB as the responsible officer for this, because I agree with your view. I think it is a whole system approach. And our, and our approach to that has, to be in, has been to engage fully and in a sportive manner with the leadership teams in, in, in Edinburgh. You'll be aware of some of the demographic issues or the socio-economic issues that the city of Edinburgh faces with relatively low unemployment. The ability to characterise care jobs at a salary range that they are offered against somewhere where they might work in a supermarket or somewhere else has been difficult because the job, the care job, is complex. It involves moving around. It involves dealing with individuals that might not be uh, completely compliant and, and polite. Um, and therefore, it's, a, it's an environment that I think causes issue with recruitment. Part of our approach, I think Alec touched on it earlier, is to really say, well, join us in terms of a care career. And there's an opportunity for you to progress beyond that uh, which you're, which you're joining the organisation. So the offer of education and development to allow people to move forward. Really trying to exploit the whole integration thing that says health and social care working together. So there's an opportunity to flip across into a health career and move forward in that way. Equally, we've identified uh, tests of change where we've tried to take care workers from the hospital environment and help the, or, or allow them to work with community colleagues and care colleagues to try and involve different models of care. We've tested that to see if that would work. We've tried to look at the criteria that says, how can we reduce the demand that actually sees care required? So evolving rehab programmes, ensuring that we can maximise people's outcome as quickly as possible to reduce the demand on that. Particular examples, David, you might want to cite? Yeah, I think Edinburgh, it is a difficult situation, um, and, and Jim's um, given good explanation for the, the reasons for Edinburgh in terms of the, the strength of the economy and full employment. Um, I think the, the, the implementation of the living wage is probably starting to help, uh, but the next stages of that, we, we, need to, we need to stick with that, and the funding the Scottish Government's made available has obviously made that possible. I think that's really important so that a, a career in care is as financially rewarding as an alternative that might be available to people in Edinburgh in that uh, high employment scenario. Edinburgh has, has achieved some major successes. So if you look at where Edinburgh was a year or so ago around, for example, the Royal Edinburgh Hospital, the transformation around people delayed in psychiatry of old age beds, which was a real critical issue in terms of the opening of phase one of the new Royal Edinburgh Hospital, that whole situation has transformed. A nurse-led team is now providing rapid response for people who might otherwise become delayed. And that, that the, the, the bed numbers are now adequate for the demand that's placed on them because of that change that the Integration Joint Board and City of Edinburgh Council working with NHS Lothian have brought in. Also, if you look at the, the length of stay of delay, so the number of delays is important because each of those is a person, an individual person and a family, but, it, but length of stay is important as so the number of bed days that, d that delays occupy and the number of days that they, they have in hospital that could otherwise be used for other forms of care. The, the, the average length of delay is coming down uh, n perhaps not as dramatically as we would like, but it is coming down steadily, and that's a really important figure. And I think the Scottish Government's recognised that in, for example, one of the six indicators for uh, integration joint boards that has been agreed is the occupied bed days for delayed discharges rather than the absolute number of delayed discharges. So I think you need to look at it in the round. Maybe add one thing. This is another area where we've also taken a financial risk because we've agreed with the City of Edinburgh that we'll both make for an additional £4 million available. Now, clearly, we've, we have got some conditions attached to that. We'd want to see some improvement. But again, we've taken a financial risk because we know part of the, the solution has to be about the investment that goes into the, to that service. So um, can you speak to maybe the IJB's... Um do they have a new strategy for, for getting additional provision into the system? For City of Edinburgh? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. that's one of the major issues. There's currently a review ongoing to look at the providers that are in play, offering um, both uh, care at home on a locality basis and across the city of Edinburgh. So there, there's an exploration of what the contract was expected to deliver and what it's actually delivered. Part of the issue has been um, provider failure. Um, not just in city of Edinburgh, but across the Lothians and, and, and beyond. So a real exploration of what, what causes um, failure, system failure, provider failure. Um, that work is ongoing right now. Okay, and you, I mean, you spoke about, you know, potential new, new models of care. Can you, can you give a bit more of an example around what sort of things you're looking at in that area? around the concept of discharge to assess that's a, that's a model of care that sees actually once a, a, an individual a person a patient has completed their health uh, treatment in an acute hospital but has residual um, uh, needs currently that that assessment process takes place in an acute ward that sees individuals that might not be dealing with that individual in the community taking forward an assessment process. And we're very keen to look at how we can bolster our assessment and rehab service, which is primary care, community-based, that allows an individual to be um, discharged home and for that assessment and rehab to be put in place within their home, more realistic, more appropriate. It takes me back to my point, if we can reduce the, the need of individuals, then overall we can reduce the demand on the care service, and, and that's an area we're looking at. Equally, we're trying to look at how we might um, sectorise the care provider so that there's a target within a community area, the engagement of within that area of both care and health resource to look at how we might provide services in a truly integrated way is something that's been explored right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, examples that's helpful. Um, hospital at home is another one. You've probably heard it referred to by various things, frailty model, etc. But we've, we've tended to call it hospital at home in in Lothian. And one of its, although its main function is to uh, see people at home who might otherwise need admitted to hospital, they have another function which is to take people from A&E or medical assessment back home quicker than they might otherwise have done and to prevent them going into the system and becoming a delayed discharge. And hospital at home often links with discharge to assess as well and they work hand in hand to make sure people get that final stage of their, their, their care which might otherwise be delivered in hospital at home. And the other innovative thing we've done is hospital to home which is NHS employed nursing assistants providing personal care uh, as a transition, a bridge between getting home and the the independent sector providers kicking in and providing the service. So that's been implemented in East Lothian and Edinburgh, for example. Okay, thank you. I, I'm looking at these numbers, though, and I'm seeing in February more delayed discharges in Lothian than in the next two highest boards put together. That's, that's a quarter of all delayed discharges, occupied bed days, as David said, are in Lothian. Who's accountable for that failure to reduce delayed discharge? Brian. Who's accountable for it? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the trite answer is, well, we all are. Um, uh, the chief executive of NHS Lothian, as accountable officer at the end of the day, um, is, is accountable. The chief, officer of the, the chief officer of the IGB is accountable. And the chief executive of City of Edinburgh Council is accountable. I mean, that is the model that we've, that we've set up. So it is a shared accountability. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the accountability primarily still rests within with the chief executive of the health board as accountable officer. Because I think what you've described is a number of uh, mechanisms to try and address the consequences of delayed discharge, but but it still rests with people coming into hospital and not going, coming out again. And many of those people coming in and the should not be coming in. A big problem. The practical um, uh, uh, manifestation of that accountability, of course, is the fact that the result of all of this, the outcome of all of this, and the failure to, to fully resolve uh, this, this issue, is that people end up lying in our acute, acute, acute beds in the Royal Infirmary. They're not, they're, not, they're not piled up outside the city chambers or anywhere else. They're occupying, occupying these beds, and therefore, in a practical day-to-day -day sense, that's where the accountability starts. And, 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 and so, given that, have you set targets for reducing this very large number, uh, and, and will you be reporting publicly on, on the achievement of those targets? So, or, that, or not? That's, we did establish performance trajectories um, in 17-18, um, and we saw some of the evidence that has been cited by by your colleague where we saw a reduction in attendance at the hospital and a reduction in admissions to hospitals. So we were tracking that very well. 
what we've been hit with, though, and what the system's been hit with is um, a series of provider failures where anticipated capacity, anticipated resource was just not able to be deployed. And we saw that immediately hit us in terms of that. I think the characterization of demand and capacity modeling in care provision is something that's only recently started to evolve in terms of its, its elegance and the information we're taking from that. So I think we are in a, a place, and we're working now on 18, 19 trajectories to actually manage and monitor the impact of some of the changes and some of the initiatives we've spoken to, spoken to you about. But on reflection, I think City of Edinburgh faces a really difficult uh, journey ahead. Um, the new leadership team uh, take up post at the beginning of next month. And one of the early agenda items I'll have with the new chief officer is around how we can best move forward to improve the situation there. And, and finally, before uh, bringing in Emma Harper on, on, on the regional aspect, uh, wh what is the relative cost of a delayed discharge person in a hospital bed versus that person in care provision at home? Susan? I mean, it's, it depends on the type of ward, but you know, about a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds a week, but that doesn't take account of all the fixed costs and in the infrastructure. Yeah. But it's it's that sort of of magnitude. Yeah. So that's or seven hundred pounds, but it depends where you are and what the rates are. Yes. Yeah. So you're talking two to three times the the, the cost, and therefore a, 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 a very significant part of that financial hit that you were talking about earlier. So. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. I'm interested in the issues around uh, the health and social care plan for the regional uh, issues as we move forward. And it was interesting to read in the report that uh, it says here that in September 2017, the progress report um, on the development of the plan highlighted a degree of frustration that work on the propositions included in the plan made marginal improvements to existing models of care. It's kind of similar to what Ash Denham has talked about with IGBs, but generating genuinely transformative propositions to deliver this disruptive innovation. So it's interesting to read the word disruptive, because I know change is disruptive, but is there a culture of people that are early adopters, change agents, or naysayers that you need to bring Dragon along for change? I mean, how? what is the plan for regional uh, issues and then as we move forward with the IGBs? So I guess the characterisation of individuals' approach to change is, is, is well rehearsed. There will be individuals who will immediately and enthusiastically embrace the concept because they see the outcome associated with the change. There's a, a spectrum down to individuals who, no matter what the outcome is, will just disengage because change is so angst for them. But I think we all recognise that that's part of NHS provision that it has been for, for the last... Uh, 40 years. So we need to recognise that and move forward in terms of that. The most up-to-date report from the region actually characterises movement and improvement. The ability for us to characterise um, significant change to generate savings, however, is limited. And, and some of the, 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 the um, advice I gave you earlier around the southeast region being characterised as an area of growth, a southeast uh, region being characterised as a 10-year demand model showing 45% for outpatients and 35% for a &E continuing to in increase is, is an issue. The boards in the southeast of Scotland have gone through a, a disruptive transformation in terms of acute services. So we have rationed, reduced the number of sites. We've reduced the number of a &Es. We've reduced the number of hospital beds. We've We've tried to move our acute specialties onto one campus rather than have them provided on different campuses. There is the opportunity to look at, could we centralise a specific specialty to a specific area and disengage that process from a locality? That that's, is significantly disruptive. And I guess that would be something that will be part of our programme as we move forward around real real alternatives and real challenges to the paradigm. Susan, do you want to I, I was just going to give you one example, because I think we need to have you know early examples and, and give confidence. So we, we've, we've just agreed that we, we will have one operational management board for laboratory services across 
the, the South East. And, and that will change, that will eventually bring about a change in how we deliver laboratory services ac across the re region and, and using new technology that means that we don't have to have every service on every site. So again, we're at very early stages. And, and if we can deliver that, that creates confidence um, in the change agenda. But, it's, 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 but that's not going to save us lots and lots of money. It's going to allow us to continue to provide the service. One of the examples I would also say is around radiology. And, and we saw um, one of our sister boards having a real issue around its ability to recruit radiologists. Um, we, the, the clinicians as a team, so the clinicians from uh, NHS Borders, NHS Lothian and NHS Fife, considered how we best, as a region, provide support to NHS Fife. Um, and using the PAX system, which is the picture archiving system um, that was in play that allows images to be acquired in one specific location but examined in various different locations, that, that would be used to try and deal with the clinical issues around provision in Fife. The issue, however, was that the report generated by the clinician found its way onto the host. So if an NHS Lothian radiologist was looking at a report from Fife and reported it, it would go into the NHS Lothian reporting system. But working with the supplier and working with uh, eHealth and others, they developed a, a, a prototype that allows the report to be generated into the host board. And that has seen a real stability be brought to bear around the provision of radiology. So it's a good example for me where regional working has actually clinician led has resulted in an ability to sustain a service. And that I think will be a theme as we go forward. I'm also just a quick sup about um, like there are certain pathways that are currently in process. For instance, Dumfries and Galloway is considered part of the East cancer pathway, which is bizarre because Dumfries and Galloway isn't in the east of any region and Stranraer folks then have to travel to Edinburgh for radiology as part of this managed clinical cancer network. So as part of this regionalisation um, that other boards will then have to move and move services and pathways to other areas, for instance. So does that affect the ability for the, the, the boards and the planning, uh, you know, is that put further challenges, I suppose, pressures on other areas? I guess all that needs to be tested out. Um, we, we do work closely with the other regional groups. So um, ideas or, or issues or changes or disruptive changes that are being developed and evolved in the West would be subject to discussion uh, with us in the, in the East and with our colleagues in the North to really understand not just what is the, the impact here, but what might be the ripple impacts be that might, <coughs> it, it, that might impact on other boards. So there is a process of engagement and collaboration. So I think anything like that would be tested out. Just okay. maybe just worth adding of that, that the, the current overlay of the regional structure that has been in place now for a year to, to produce or to look at um, a planning from a regional perspective has been fairly roughly hewn. I mean, it was, it was put in place fairly quickly and a lot of people, people recognised that there were anomalies and there were overlaps and perhaps gaps in the way that the lines had been drawn between between east, west, and, 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 and north. And as Jim says, that is, being, that is being sort of reconciled pragmatically by making sure that we all stick together on this and talk to each other about it. You can well imagine that as the regional initiative develops and, 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 and gathers strength, that there will be further revisions and, and, and honing, if you like, of regional <coughs> boundaries and definitions as we go forward. Yeah, just on the cancer point, though, regardless of the regional work, when and we are reviewing the cancer centre and its provision, a lot of the focus here is about how could we provide care closer to home so people don't have to travel from the priest up, up to Edinburgh. So what could we do more closely at home? I mean, we do provide a facility for people to stay, yes. obviously, overnight, and that's that's great. But actually, how much of this could be repatriated back, as it were, to the, the actual board itself? So regardless of the regional bit, and it will get picked up through that process, there's another process that issues like that would get flagged as well. Such as radiotherapy or something like that to be so, disseminated. So, more so I guess it'll be it'll be dependent on each pathway. I think the point you made was about pathways as well, and what can be reasonably done uh, in a local hospital versus the stuff that needs to be done in a centre, because that's the more specialist high end stuff. So it'll be more of the kind of more routine treatments that would be provided more locally.
the, onco the oncologists would be very clear, though, around the journey, the cancer journey should be within a team, a recognised network, because if elements of it are provided or uh, undertaken out with that, that network, then there can be differences in the approach, different protocols, and, and, and increased risk for individual patients. So it's not as simple as taking a part of the journey of the cancer uh, the clinical pathway and moving it around. It's about looking at the whole process and saying, how can we best offer a service? And I think, as, as Alex said, our ambitions around our new regional cancer centre would see us engaging with all current users and all current board and all boards to see if there's a better pathway that can be evolved as part of that development. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. That's been a very full session. Can I thank our, our colleagues for their input and our witnesses for their evidence? I'm, uh, my apologies to those colleagues who have still had further questions they would like to ask. Uh, we will write to you uh, with a f further follow-up letter probably in the course of next month. Uh, and no doubt some of those additional points will, will be raised there, but also to pursue some of the points on the evidence we have heard today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We will now uh, take a five-minute break and then move into private session thereafter. <laughs>